We have a sketch right here that shows a conductor of length L and cross-sectional area A. There are n charge carriers per cubic meter, each carrier having a charge Q and moving at an average drift velocity of Vd. Current is nothing but the flow of charge, so it would be the total charge flowing through the conductor divided by total time taken for all the charge to flow. So let's calculate the numerator and the denominator separately and then combine them at the end. If there are n charge carriers per cubic meter, then the total number of charge carriers in the conductor with length L and cross-sectional area A will be n times A times L. I now know the total number of charge carriers in the conductor. In order to arrive at the total charge flowing through the conductor, all I need to do is to multiply the total number of charge carriers with the charge on each carrier. The charge on each electron is Q, so this becomes NAL times Q. Now that I have my numerator taken care of, let's move on to the denominator. Since I need to find the relationship between current and velocity, I'm going to bring in a velocity term here and equate it to the time taken. What's the relationship between velocity and time? We know velocity is equal to distance divided by time. So time will be equal to distance divided by velocity. In the case of our conductor, the last charge carrier located at the extreme end will have to travel the entire length of the conductor L. Its average drift velocity is Vd. So time taken for the last charge carrier to leave the cylindrical wire is L divided by Vd. Current is total charge flowing by total time taken. Now that we have a numerator and denominator terms taken care of, we'll simply plug them here. The L's in the top and the bottom cancel out and the Vd term goes to the top. So we get this. I is equal to N times A times Q times Vd, which is a relationship between current and drift velocity. So if I know my I, N, A and Q values, my drift velocity will be nothing but this. What can we say looking at this equation? How is current and drift velocity related? For a given current value, the larger the charge carrier density of the conductor material, the lower will be the drift velocity. And this should make sense as a large amount of charge carriers would result in overcrowding and a big traffic jam. Also, a thinner wire with a smaller cross-sectional area would mean a higher drift velocity for the charge carriers. If you look at one particular conductor, when the current is increased, the only term that can increase is velocity as all the other things, A, Q and N, are constant for that particular conductor. So a higher current value results in a higher drift velocity. And this should be pretty straightforward as current is time taken for charges to flow. An increase in current must mean that the charges are flowing at a faster rate, or in other words, their velocity is greater than before. So let's work out an example to understand this drift velocity better. What we're going to do here is to estimate the average drift speed of an electron in a copper wire. Uh, we know the area of cross-section of this copper wire, which is 1 into 10 to the power minus 7 meters square, and the current value is 1.5 amps. We also know the density of copper in the wire, which is given in kilograms. The problem gives me the atomic mass of copper. Why is that? Well, we'll soon find out why. We're also told to assume that there's one conduction electron per atom in the conductor, which essentially means that the number of atoms and free electrons in the conductor are the same. So how do I calculate my drift? We know the relationship between current and drift. I is equal to N times E times A times Vd. So my drift is given by I over N times E times A. What are the values we already know here? We know the current I, which is 1.5 amps. We know the area of cross section, which is given by 1 into 10 to the power minus 7 meters square. And we also know E, which is the charge of an electron, 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs. 
So the only thing left to calculate is N, which is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. We're assuming that there's one conduction electron per atom. What that essentially means is that the number of copper atoms in the wire, in other words, its density, will be equal to the density of the electrons. And if I know the density of the electrons, I know my value of n, as n is nothing but number of free electrons per unit volume in the wire. So we know the density of copper in the wire, 9000 kilograms per cubic meter. This means one cubic meter of wire has a mass of 9,000 kilograms. But we're really not interested in what the mass of copper atoms per cubic meter is, are we? Our aim here is to find the number of free electrons per unit volume, for which we need to find the number of copper atoms per unit volume. So how do we convert this mass into number of atoms? That's where the atomic mass comes in. An atomic mass of an element simply tells us the mass of 6 in the 10 to the power 23 atoms of that particular element. So in the case of copper, the atomic mass is 63.5 grams, which means 6 in the 10 to the power 23 atoms of copper have a combined mass of 63.5 grams. So the question here is simply this, if 63.5 grams have 6 in the 10 to the power 23 atoms, how many atoms would 9000 kilograms contain? It would be the number of atoms in a unit mass say 1 kilogram multiplied by 9000 kilograms, right? So to calculate the number of atoms per unit mass, I simply divide the number of atoms in 63.5 grams which we already know is 6 in the 10 to the power 23 atoms by 63.5 grams. So that will give me the number of atoms in one gram of copper. And what we'll do is we'll multiply this with 9000 kilograms. So this becomes 6 into 10 to the power 23 into 9,000 kilograms divided by 63.5 grams. If you notice, I have a kilogram in my numerator while my denominator is in grams. So in order to solve for this, both my numerator and my denominator have to be in the same units. So we'll convert our kilograms into grams. 1,000 grams is one kilogram. So my number of atoms now becomes 6 into 10 to the power 23 into 9 into 10 to the power 3 into 10 to the power 3 divided by 63.5. And if you solve all of this, you will see that it sums up to 8.5 into 10 to the power 28 atoms. So 
So the number of copper atoms per unit volume is 8.5 into 10 to the power 28. which is also equal to n, or the number of free electrons per unit volume, as we are assuming one conduction electron per atom. Since we know the value of n, we now have everything we need to calculate the drift. Vd is i, which is this, divided by n, into A, which is this, into the charge of an electron, which is this. So if you simplify all of this, you get 1.1 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter per second, or 1.1 millimeter per second. Hmm. 1.1 millimeter per second. Looks like our electrons travel at a very low speed. Then how is it that when we flip on a switch, the light turns on immediately? The reason your light turns on so fast when you flip the switch is that electrons don't have to travel all the way from your switch to the bulb for current to flow. Three electrons are already present in every nano inch of the wires leading up to the light bulb. The turning on of a switch simply provides a push which causes all these electrons to flow through your light bulb instantaneously and create a current flow. Let's explain this in another way. It's like having 100 people lined up one behind another. What would happen if I were to push the last person? He would fall on the person in front of him who would in turn displace the person ahead of him and so on. This would set up a chain reaction which would cause all the 100 people in the line to fall forward. The same thing happens with three electrons in a circuit. The electron closest to the light bulb falls through creating an instantaneous current flow.